compensation can be anything that helps people of African descent in this country build wealth, said Com Howard, a co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, NCOBRA. It can be a check. It can be some type of tax relief. It can be business grants. It can be education grants. It can be anything to help us build wealth. But most people look at compensation as a personal check and we're not in disagreement with that. Reparations advocates like Howard argue there's enough evidence to prove the lasting effect of generational trauma on people like descendants of Jews who were victims of the Nazis. Or they cite the 2016 United Nations report which found the legacy of colonial history, enslavement, racial subordination and segregation, racial terrorism and racial inequality in the United States remains a serious challenge. However, reparations has been largely considered impractical. Not all people of color in the United States are descended from slaves, and not all are impoverished. It's also expensive and would cost the U.S. government $6 trillion to as much as $14 trillion. University of Connecticut professor Thomas Kramer arrived at that range by calculating the value of slave labor at prevailing wages from 1776 to 1865, compounded at 3% annually. Toward the end of the Civil War, the idea of compensation for black slaves emerged in 1865, when Union General William Tecumseh Sherman issued an order granting freed slaves 40 acres of land along the southern coast. The phrase, 40 acres and a mule, would later come from this order. But that promise was broken when, after Abraham Lincoln's assassination, President Andrew Johnson reversed the order, returning the land to its original owners. The idea of reparations resurfaced during the civil rights movement, in a 1969 Black Manifesto, which in part demanded $500 million in reparations from white churches and synagogues for black enslavement and continuing discrimination and oppression. In 1972, around the time of a presidential election, civil rights activist Reverend Jesse Jackson demanded a $900 million freedom budget. And when Jackson first ran for president in 1988, he made monetary reparations a part of his campaign platform. Still, the idea has remained mostly on the margins of political discourse in America. But by 1989, when Rep. John Conyers, D. Michigan, first introduced a bill called the Commission to Study Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act, the idea of seeking financial redress from the government wasn't considered so outlandish. Conyers's bill, H.R. 40, in homage to 40 acres and a mule, requested a commission to acknowledge and study the impact of slavery and of the economic, social, and political discrimination against descendants of enslaved Africans in America. Once the effects of slavery were legitimately established, the commission would then make recommendations for repairing the harm done to living African Americans. In order to claim reparations, harm or injury has to be proven. Historians have argued that reparations were at least owed to former slaves for property they should have received. But they also note that slavery alone may not account for the entire disparity in wealth between whites and African Americans, which could also be the result of policies put in place after the end of Reconstruction. Over the next 28 years, Conyers repeatedly introduced the Reparations Commission Bill in the House, where it received little bipartisan support. In public arena, writers like Tana Heise Coates, who had previously opposed reparations, resuscitated the idea. In 2014, he published his widely debated essay The Case for Reparations in the Atlantic magazine. Coates, reflecting in a recent interview with New York magazine, said, When I wrote The Case for Reparations, my notion wasn't that you could actually get reparations passed, even in my lifetime. My notion was that you could get people to stop laughing. Once you got them to stop laughing, you could get them to start fighting. Harris's Lift the Middle Class Act isn't race-specific, but the presidential hopeful has said it would uplift 60% of black families who are in poverty, along with all low- to middle-class Americans.
the aggressive anti-poverty bill would give families with an income of $100,000 or less up to $500 in monthly cash payments, in addition to public benefits and tax credits they already receive. Only working families, those struggling with stagnant income and rising costs of living, would benefit from this race-blind policy that would redistribute wealth. But although Harris claims her proposal would lift 9 million people out of poverty, it wouldn't specifically benefit African Americans, whose unemployment rate is double that of white Americans, according to the Economic Policy Institute. His American Opportunity Accounts Act, also known as his baby bonds, would set up newborns from low-income families, regardless of race, with a low-risk savings account. The poorest families in this wealth-building program get up to a total of $50,000 in their child's trust account managed by Treasury, which would receive annual deposits in proportion to the family's income. At 18, the child can withdraw the money and use it for wealth-building uses like paying for college or buying property. But if Booker becomes president and his bill passes his first year, the first babies to receive a savings account won't be born until around 2022. The first beneficiaries wouldn't be able to withdraw funds until they turn 18 in 2040. One of the few candidates who's explicitly endorsed slavery reparations, former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Julian Castro, said it's one way for America to resolve its original sin of slavery. It is interesting to me that, under our Constitution and otherwise, that we compensate people if we take their property, Castro said in an interview. Shouldn't we compensate people if they were property, sanctioned by the state? Castro's pro-reparations proposal aligns with H.R. 40, in establishing a commission to determine the best way to repay descendants of slaves. Marianne Williamson is the only candidate to take a bold stance on monetary compensation to descendants of slaves. The best-selling author and self-help guru has listed reparations as one of her key campaign issues and proposed a $200 billion, $500 billion plan of reparations for slavery, the money to be dispersed over a period of 20 years. Although she's the only candidate to specify an amount for reparations, Williamson hasn't offered a plan for distributing these funds, except through an esteemed Council of African American Leaders Council. Yet she's criticized policies that don't directly offer monetary compensation, like those offered by her presidential competitors, telling Fortune, race-conscious policies are not a substitute for reparations, because they treat a symptom without acknowledging the cause. The first question to be made in the case for reparations is a practical one, which is how can we imagine putting together a political alliance that can prevail on an issue like that, Adolf Reed a University of Pennsylvania professor and a left-wing critic of reparations, told News Pulse News. The more broadly based coalition you can build, the better you are at winning, he said. And winners, added Reed, can create political and economic reform that promises to improve the material conditions of the vast majority of black Americans and increase the economic security of other Americans as well and reparations might not be the best idea for a candidate to rally behind in a crowded field. Still, the opportunity for a national conversation is better than before, says Duke University professor and reparations advocate William Sandy Darity, who says policies like reparations represent a break with kind of the moderatism that's been characteristic of the Democratic Party. In a climate where people are considering things that are bolder, more dramatic, more transformative, Darity, who's written extensively on reparations and was one of the economists who created Booker's baby bonds model, credits the last presidential election with the willingness of 2020 candidates to discuss bold ideas like reparations. The changed environment might be a consequence of the shock effect of the Trump election, he said. It's created an opportunity for the conversation to turn to reparations in a much more serious way than it has in the past.